Good afternoon, and welcome to Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. This is where you will meet some of the most intelligent and creative people who come to share tips, resources, and knowledge on various topics. My guests come from industries that include education, health and wellness, film, television, community uh, advocates, mental health, and so much more. Join me today in welcoming my guest, Mr. David Roach. David is the co-founder of the Familyhood Connection and the Oakland International Film Festival. Welcome, David. Ah, thank you, Kelly. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me ah. and you being here. So thank you. <laughs> I'm loving it. I cannot wait to get into our conversation. Ah, However, before we get immersed in this exciting ah. conversation, I'd like to read a little bit about you. Okay. So David is a former point guard, lead off man, and an all-time quarterback. David is a graduate of Morehouse College, co-founder of the Familyhood Connection, and which is also known as Mo Better Food, the Oakland Film Society, which is also known as the Oakland International Film Festival. He is also a writer and author of The Adventures of Hotep. So David, talk to me about this point guard, whatever. Okay, I'm not yeah. into so, that. <laughs> so I was the point, uh, uh, you know, I played basketball growing up and like many, young children they want to become professionals one day and so my position was always point guard who who makes the plays in a sense right um and then baseball season would come and then i was the leadoff man okay and then um and then just in the neighborhood you know the all-time quarterback is when you actually are the quarterback for both teams mm. and so you're really like calling the plays and just trying to get everybody you know the best passes without you know, getting in the middle of who you really want to win, you got to do good for both sides. And so I thought that was an important part to add to my bio, because one, I, I like to remember my childhood and, and to kind of keep that child. And that's kind of what Hotep is in a sense, you know, it's kind of like my child side and then trying to, um, yeah, so that's pretty much the point guard and, um, you know, Leadoff man and um, all-time quarterback. Story. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Well, that helped me because I know nothing about football. Okay. okay. Now, okay. so David, tell me where were you born and raised, and what schools did you attend? Okay, I was born in San Francisco, and I attended Frederick Burke in San Francisco, and then we moved to Foster City. Then I attended Audubon Elementary School. Bowditch Middle School, San Mateo High School, and then I graduated and then attended Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, okay. And one of the things that I did not do that I wanted to do was to walk down memory lane in terms of mm -hmm. how we met. Yes, okay. And so I met you when I was the receptionist at KKSF Radio, uh, Julie Nakahari Kurtz, actually, mm -hmm. and Kurtz is her new last name since she's married, introduced okay. us. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? I do remember that. I do remember that. And it was, um, I had returned to the Bay Area, I believe, and I hadn't heard talk to Judy, Julie in such a long time. And then she says, you know, I really want you to meet this amazing person that I work with. And it was Kelly Armstrong. And so, oh, okay. uh, so that was, yeah, so that was some moons ago, but we won't yeah. go there right now. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. And yeah. then also Jackie Wright, who is your publicist for the Oakland Film Festival, has also kept me Im immersed in our connection together, you know, because I would volunteer with her yes. for, you know, every yes. year when you would have the event. And so because our interview is going to be a part one and part two, so part one yeah. will be with the Familyhood Connection that we're getting yes. ready to get into. And then part two will be about the Oakland Film Festival because you're going into your 20th event. That's right, 20th, yes, yeah, that's right. And so that's gonna be exciting to talk about that. So mm -hmm. tell me now, your dad owned a sandwich shop called Max Meat located on MacArthur and 91st in East Oakland. Is this where the relationship between Mo Better Foods and the African-American farmers of California began with your organization, The Familyhood Connection? Talk well, about know, that journey. It, um, well, you mentioned uh, Jackie Wright, and I, I think it would be remiss of me to not mention that uh, really, you, you said she's our publicist, but really when our events happen, mm -hmm. basically we work for Jackie. 
Oh, okay. So <laughs> I she, believe it. She, yeah. So Jackie Wright is like, she's done, she's, a, she, she's such an activist and activist yes. in the community. Yes. And yes. she's done way more than a publicist. She's really like, you know, keeps her, keeps her ears to the, to the ground. And, and uh, the first thing is the, the wellness of the community. And okay. I've always, and it's always been a very special, um, you know, just to keep in contact with her over the years. Okay. Um, every year is different. Yeah. You know, because we all grow and we do different things. And she's been spending more time in Texas and different things. But, um, but to say that I'm always, always excited to hear her voice and to hear what's percolating because she has all these ideas and she always like really like stands up for, for the community. And that's something that we always want to be a part of. Yeah. And not to mention, she's also a filmmaker herself. Yes. And we had, we, we, we showed her film on her father yes. Yes. And, uh, who was in the military and, um, and that was amazing. She had both her mom and dad's body exhumed so they could be buried together on mm -hmm. a military gravesite. Yes, it yeah. was phenomenal. Absolutely right. incredible. Yes, yes, yes. I think somebody needs to do a piece on Jackie. But that's well, you know, I did. No, I oh, do have you? a I have a podcast okay, with her see? talking see exactly. Think? <laughs> yeah, we think. Okay. Talking okay. exactly about that. So yeah. now, while yes. you were at Morehouse, you were assigned mm -hmm. to find economical solutions for the African American community, mm -hmm. and you concluded that you could feed ourselves out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And from that, the adventures of your HOTEP began. So right. does HOTEP come before Mo Better Food or are they one in the same? Provide more background for me. <laughs> okay, <It's> kind of <laughs> confusing. But um, so um, you mentioned my father and his place, Max Meat. And he, um, my father is from Texas, Palestine, Texas. And he was uh, a sharecropper part of the part of the season, um, and you know, picked cotton, and um, and had a place called Max Meat, which was near Castlemont High School, which is where I actually taught high school. Okay. Uh, and here in Oakland, and um, and so I think when. I was at Morehouse and, and doing this research to find economic solutions. Um, what I discovered was that there really weren't many solutions given uh, for like prime, like um, when you, problems are often talked about, you know, we have problems in housing. We have, we're, we're the last to be hired. We're the first to be fired. We don't, you know, we don't get uh, monies from banks. They don't loan money, you know, the, and, um, and so really I kind of transitioned my, my research to say, well, how have we been surviving despite the racism and the discrimination? And then I came across Tuskegee Institute. Mm. Uh, which, which was uh, founded by Booker T. Washington. And Booker T. Washington then um, heard about the first uh, African-American to receive a master's uh, degree in agriculture, a man by the name of Dr. Uh, George Washington Carver. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he wrote a letter to Carver and asked him to, to come to Tuskegee and to help lift his people out of degradation into manhood mm. and uh, Carver said this letter was like a note for God and he was a very religious person uh, Carver was a part of this religious organization while he attended Iowa State University and uh, in fact the guy who ended up funding a lot of Tuskegee was a classmate of his part of this religious group who became the head of the United States Department of Agriculture Okay. So that became a connection that Booker T benefited from that Carver had established while at Iowa State. Mm. So Carver goes there, he fills, he tests the soil and finds out that, you know, after years of, of, of growing cotton, which was in, you know, happening in Alabama, uh, it actually takes nutrients out of the soil. And he started planting peanuts, which is a lugum, which actually puts the nutrients back in the soil. 
And so that was why people often calls him the peanut doctor because he actually planted so many peanuts and it was really to build the soil and to start something called crop rotation where after you plant uh-huh. something, you grow something else later. And, um, and so, so there was an abundance of peanuts and the way the story goes is Carver took all these peanuts, stayed in his laboratory for like weeks and then came out with over 300 inventions from the peanut, including peanut butter, including like peanut oil, including some kind of gasoline from peanut. I mean, so oh, many wow. came wow. from Wow, okay. Over, yeah. Is- Mm-hmm. And um, and he had a student named Thomas Campbell who would take, who had to escape from his own family to attend Tuskegee because his father kept promising him like, hey, you know, we need you on the farm, but next year you can attend Tuskegee. Okay. Well, he got <laughs> tired of hearing about next year and he decided to run away and he became one of uh, Carver's top students who, gr- who drove what was called the movable school. And mm-hmm. the movable school was a, uh, a wagon that Carver had designed where they would take the knowledge um, from Tuskegee and actually bring it to the communities around uh, Tuskegee, Alabama. And, um, and that really, when I heard that story, it was, and then Marcus Garvey read a book about Up From Slavery written by Booker T. Washington, where he kind of talks about this and wanted to take, you know, to build that in Jamaica Uh, Later on, Mahatma Gandhi in India was using the same movable school concept. It spread to Botswana, it spread to China and other rural areas. And and so I became really fascinated with how we were able to create our solutions ourselves, despite the fact that, you know, when I was doing this research, the USDA had what was called the Pixford first USDA uh, case, where uh, one of the black farmers had filed a, a, a class action a lawsuit against the USDA, which denied loans to black farmers. Uh, this came out to be about a $2.3 billion settlement. Wow. Which just, you know, kind of ended about, I say about 10 years ago. And so, um, so when I started teaching at Castleman High School near my father's Max Meet, um, I had a student Revisit, who came back to visit, who had graduated, and she had a child. And she said, Mr. Roach, you know, she was just there visiting, like going, you know, teacher to teacher. And she came by and I said, why are you feeding your child candy? And she said, well, where can I find fruits and vegetables around here? And it kind of hit me like, okay, the research that I did at Morehouse is really a, t- a time to move on, you know, getting these black farmers in California, to bring the food into this community. And, and then we can create our own markets, we can create jobs from it, and we can eat healthier and we don't have to rely on other people to feed us. And so when I say that we could feed ourselves out of poverty, the idea is that knowing that agriculture is the number one industry in California, but, we don't, but we're less than a third of 1% of the farmers in California, and we have many liquor stores in our communities, but, but rarely do you see grocery stores. Absolutely. So yeah. Absolutely. That was kind of like the beginning. Uh-huh. Wow. You know, and I love the historical context, mm. you know, uh, fascinating, you know, and so I just learned something about the cotton draining the, the soil from its nutrients. And then Mr. Peanut Man Mr. putting Peanut. it back, you know, right. he, he's putting the nutrients back, you know, that, and yeah. it's just amazing. Now, you know, I ran a culinary program over at the Bayview YMCA, and it was a, it's a liquor store across the street from it. Mm-hmm. I guess it's a liquor store. I don't know. I guess it's a liquor store, grocery store, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. But they had no, it was just all potato chips and da, 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 da. Right. And my goal, what I wanted so desperately was to have a food truck across yeah. the street, you know, right on that corner where I could, you know, in the morning, they could right. come and buy fruit, and, you That's know, right. fresh drinks and whatnot. Anyways, um, so I understand the, mm-hmm. you know, the food deserts in our community. So right. I think it's wonderful that you're doing that. So now from what I know, the familyhood is a global vision of building a healthy, sustainable community for the people that live in that community. That's and right. two of your models drive the familyhood. Could you tell me what they are? Yes. Um, well, the, 
the first model is that every it's a familyhood is defines the school as a center of the community. Okay. And and not just the physical location of the school. It actually sees the school as all of the intelligence that have been a part of the school. Mm. So it's you know so um so in other words if you are a graduate and alumni you're still part of familyhood the school if you're a student entering a school you're still part of the familyhood and the and and so so the two models are every school shall have a student government association a functioning parent teacher association and a functioning alumni association and okay. the second is every school should have a garden a farmer's market and a grocery store and basically the organizations that I mentioned for model one actually run the garden, the farmer's market and the grocery store. Okay, so mm -hmm. now talk about the do now strategy and these are happening in the schools, but before you do that, how do you get schools involved? How, what, what does that entail? <laughs> That's a good question. That's a great question. <laughs> okay, um, well, it's been different at every school. And okay. it's sort of like, um, you know, uh, we started with McClyman's High School because I, I taught at McClyman's High School. Okay. And they eventually were able to get a garden over there. And then they had a program called Planning Justice that kind of took over the garden. And then we had to work with some of their people and some of the alumni that I knew personally. So it was kind of like a lower hanging fruit because I had actually taught at the school. Okay. Um, my children at one time attended Oakland Tech High School. And because I was always at Oakland Tech, I happened to meet with the principal and then you know, share what our vision is and how we want to have a school garden and get students involved. And so we worked directly with a garden club that was you know connected to the science teacher there okay um then we then we started uh first saturdays which is what we call our do now strategy is first saturdays meaning that meaning that that's the a monthly volunteer day that's what we call it okay um and more recently we're working with hoover elementary school in west oakland which is run by wanda stewart who who, who runs the garden there and who actually you know has an amazing garden um, and students are very much involved in the school. And so to say that it's, it, it works differently at every school to get started. Um, and what we're really working towards is to really become more of a platform where, stu where once we get them started, we can connect the schools. So they okay. can actually, so the parents or the PTA at one school could say, hey, how's the PTA doing at you know, McClyman's? Like, what are you all doing? This is what we're doing. You know, student government can say, hey, this is what we're doing. What are you guys doing over at that school? So we're really working to develop a platform um, with firstsaturdays.com and um, to actually promote the, the governance piece. Um, because as we, as we talk about, as you mentioned, um, to build a sustainable community, the reason why we see this model as being sustainable is that if the organizations are always functioning, mm -hmm. government, PTA, and alumni, that means that if somebody you know passes away, you know, because you get parents all the time who are very active in a school, right? They're doing amazing things um, because their child attends that school. Well, as soon as their child graduates, the parent leaves with their child. Right. And so now <laughs> the school has to fill those shoes again. And yeah. so what we're saying is that if the student government has a role with the garden with the farmers market the parent you know the pta has a role with that garden farmers market as long as they see these these school based enterprises as projects that they you know plan and manage right they'll always be able to run these these industries so now it's kind of like a train the trainer approach isn't it a tree and the trainer approach is i don't, no, I don't know no train no train the trainer so train, you, train. The, you know, so the, the, the students and the parents and the, the that first, le that first leg, who's, who's training them or, or, or your farmers training them or who's doing the training? That's a very good question. Well, see, it's, 
it's one thing about when the people come together through first Saturdays, uh-huh. you kind of see who's there. And okay. you kind of are able to, to determine what, what needs, like what kind of experience you have. As I said, at, at Oakland Tech, we have a garden club. So the teacher, the science club, they're very much aware of how to build soil, how to compost. You know, um, they're less involved with how to reach out to people. They have their little club, it's students, you know what I mean? And so, um, so same with McClymans, they're, they have planning justice. They're a group that does school gardens. And so they know a lot about gardens, where to, where to find good soil, where to find their starter plants, seeds, you know, those kind of things. Hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's very interesting. And like I said, it's, it's got a lot of layers to it, it mm-hmm. seems like. Now, <laughs> so listening to you say this, so we know now you know the teachers and the parents and whatnot Mm -hmm. how how the schools that aren't involved what is the approach how do you knock on the door well that's part of the reason why we um we went out to the superintendent of of OUSD um you know Miss Kyla uh Johnson Tremell and we've and they've signed on to support it so we're sort of going top Oh, nice. down to endorse it and then to help us push it throughout the schools. Uh, right now, we're working on a pilot that would be in West Oakland and connect the schools, as I mentioned, Hoover, which is the elementary school, all the way through to McClyman's High School. Nice. And, so, and so once we get the pilot going, we can then kind of replicate that same kind of effort um, in East Oakland and uh, other parts of Oakland. Oh, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the other thing that I find kind of fascinating is that every school should have a garden, a farmer's market in the grocery stores. Now tell me about the farmers. Where do they fit in? So you have a collection of Black farmers that you work with. Is that not true? Yes, I do. And others do now. Okay. Um, so w- when we started Mo Better Food, we started working with the African-American farmers of California. And after um, a few years, we received a planning grant uh, to start a grocery store in West Oakland. And that became the Mandela Foods Co-op, which is in West Oakland on 7th Street. Okay. And, um, and in a sense, it was, you know, it was, a, it was very successful. We were happy about that. Um, at the same time, it was, it didn't feel sustainable because it's just our organization, you know, building, you know, the garden, I mean, you know, like the grocery store concept, the farmer's market. Um, So familyhood sort of was, it was more about, well, how can we empower the community to take this over? So it's Mm -hmm. not just about our organization trying to do it for the community. Yes. And so that's why we call it a systemic approach, because if we work with the school and the schools are some of the, um, the oldest kind of legacy entities in our neighborhoods you know in some communities you could you could find children who say oh my grandmother attended this school right you know and so we're trying to tap into the legacy of how to uh to preserve the actual um ownership you know one thing about uh, Booker T. Washington, he mentioned in the book Up From Slavery, that one day he happened to be passing by the school and he overheard a student tell another student, don't put your initials in this, on this wall. We built these walls, hmm. you know, and, and so we need to have a certain type of, of ownership. And, and so that's a big part of familyhood is to, is to really you know, create this pipeline that says all students should be in student government association because that's what schools, you know, that's how, you know, you can gain your voice. That's how you can organize yourself, learn how to meet, how to share, how to plan together. And it's, it'll be very, and you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but you'd be surprised <laughs> how many, how many schools do not have student government or organizations functioning now, and how many schools, especially in the Black community, do not have student government associations functioning. And mm-hmm. so, so that's part of why we put those on our mottos, because we really want to emphasize how important it is to understand governance, uh, if, especially if you're Black, because we know historically we weren't even allowed to vote. 
And so it's important that we actually are in governing and learning how to govern and plan as early as possible. And I think that there are some, you know, some psychological things that we may go into later, I'm not sure, that, that play a part when you grow up in a neighborhood that you don't feel like you're a part of because you're not, it's always like, okay, you can, cause I can remember so many times where my students would say, what they doing over there? It's mm -hmm. like, well, you're supposed to know what they're doing over there because this is your community. Yeah. What are we doing in our community? You see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so, so it's about really the handshake between student government association and alumni. Yeah. And that's what we're really trying to create. And we, so we wanna plant the seed as early in the minds of the student that one day you're going to be an alumni and you're going to be in control of this community because you're like an elder in your neighborhood and this school will always be a home for you. You know, and that's one of the things that I found fascinating about your healthy economics campaign is that you mentioned that the majority of the students attend are from low income communities and upon graduation, they leave the communities as soon as an opportunity happens but your campaign actually motivates the educate, educated ones to stay. And staying doesn't necessarily mean physically staying, but just being abreast of community affairs. What's going on in my community and what can I do? And this just reminded me of the departure of the black middle-class professionals back in you know, the day which stripped us from our role models yes. where, you know what I mean? So seeing that you're trying to bring that back together Yes. Is, is absolutely amazing. So my next question to you were, what were some of the, the challenges? And you kind of psychologically talked about some of them, but what, what are some more challenges that you face dealing with trying to get, you know, people to get on board with what you're doing? Well, um, I, I don't think that we have had a real specific challenge as it the biggest challenge has been really myself, I think, in, in being very clear and okay. trying to, um, you know, as you mentioned, some things were kind of confusing. You see different layers. Yes. And so, um, so in trying to, like I'm working on a, this other, the Familyhood Handbook, which is another outline to kind of illustrate it more clearer and, okay. um, and to hopefully, um, you know, share with schools that I think that they have a, an, an extended role they could play. Mm -hmm. Like you just can't see yourself as, you know, um, trying to make it a win-win for the school where they can say that, you know, if I give this student the best four years of their, of their life, of, you know, in their education, I can then hold on to them for the rest of their life where they'll come back as an alumni to be a benefit to the school and to the community. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, um, so right now, as I mentioned, as we're working on this pilot, you know, when you have examples of, of, of how it works, I think you actually can overcome some of the obstacles because once people see something working somewhere, they're like, oh, that, you know, exactly. there's McDonald's, you know, there's some over there, we can go over here, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. so, so it's been really about, you know, the information, making it more crystal clear and, um, and then just, you know, reaching out to the schools and, um, and then periodically we run into angels like yourself who say, hey, you know, this is interesting. Like, hey, can we do, you know, what is that about? And so, yeah, yeah. Um, so that helps me and, and, you know, to understand what, cause sometimes you can get so close to something you may not see like you're supposed to know you know to add you know a certain amount of salt to make this good but right right you know what I mean <laughs> um but if somebody tells you that hey I yeah. didn't taste any salt in there then you're like oh I, I thought I had put some you know so mm -hmm. um, yeah absolutely yeah well because, you know what was because but at, but at the same time they're kind of coming our way you know um meaning that there's this huge uh movement called community schools. And in, in this, like they're gonna roll out about 1200 soon, the governor Newsom here in the state of California, where they're looking at how, and but they're putting their responsibility more on the parents oh. as, as being, and they even admit that it's not sustainable. 
And, um, and so I don't necessarily, I am, as you, as I mentioned, the PTA and parents are very important, but it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what our voice is kind of different about when it comes to familyhood is because for one, I think that there is a major decline of the black family. There's a major decline of even parents in our neighborhoods that actually can participate. Most of our parents are always working two, three jobs, just trying to stay in the neighborhood. Right. So right. when this whole community school thing unfolds and the way, you know, schools are already closing in our neighborhoods are, are, are they're talking about closing some schools, especially in the black community. Um, I'm hoping that familyhood could, could, could actually be a, a better option to actually keep the schools and empower the community to run the schools. Wow, that's so amazing. That's just really kind of sad to hear that mm -hmm. they're closing schools like that's that. Right. It's like, you know, and then when I think about how when you go to the grocery stores, like a Safeway or Whole Foods or whatever, and you're buying this organic vegetables and stuff that we used to get organically <laughs> anyway, when I was growing up, and now all of a sudden it's a premium you pay for it. So that's being right. able to teach people how, and especially you know, our people, how to feed themselves is so important. And that's why I wanted to do this interview with you because I want to help get the message out Thank because you. it is important. That's right. It is so important. Um, you know, now one of the things I know you received a certificate of congressional recognition from um, Congresswoman Barbara Lee from Mo Better Foods. Talk about that for me. What, what got her interested in what you were doing? Well, um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, that was, I think, about 98, 99, when we were hosting the Black Family, uh, Black Farmer celebrations. And we were, um, you know, as I, we talked about hosting the farmer's market with, at my father's place, the Max Meat. Um, we hosted some other events. Um, we were just proactive. It was, a, it was a time when there weren't really farmers market in our community. There, were, there was not a relationship really happening with black farmers. Um, and uh, I remember we were holding this event and I got a call mm -hmm. and it said, hey, you know, Congresswoman Barbara Lee wants to give you the certificate. And um, it was after we held the Mo Better Foods Conference in San Francisco, where we had uh, Ben Burkett come down from Mississippi, who was their president of their co-op. Uh, we had um, some urban gardeners. Um, oh, wow. you, might, you might remember Catherine Sneed, who was doing some work in San Francisco with uh, prisoners and doing some gardening work in the Hunters Point area. Um, so, you know, just being busy trying to do the work. And then all of a sudden, sometimes I think you get recognized for what you do. Yes, absolutely. It was a, it was it was a beautiful um, to to you know to have her support and um, and we just kept going. We started, you know, uh, students in my class started conducting research more. Um, they actually came up with you know you know, it was kind of like, well, Mr. Roach, like, what should we do? Like, I was like, mm -hmm. I, like I want I want y'all to think about it. You know, they wanted to write like once they. It was during a time that you might remember a, a search engine called Ask Jeeves. Yes, I remember, I remember, remember that. Well, yes. Uh -huh. So we so it was Yahoo and Hotmail <laughs> days, and um, and so there was information on the internet about the Pigsford versus USDA case, as I mentioned earlier, where you know black farmers weren't receiving you know settlements from the USDA, and I mean not settlements but funding from the USDA. So it turned out to be this $2.3 billion settlement. And um, so I think it was a combination of the students wanting to get involved and, okay. to, say that, and to say, hey, let's, let's create a market for our farmers here at the school. And we started it at McClymouth High School um, where we, uh, on an ongoing basis, provided a location. Uh, my students did, you know, they created flyers in Microsoft Office and learned how to how to develop a website using front page and so i so i taught uh, business and you know and they had to um and they used our farmers market as part of a project nice. and so i think a combination of those things um, um got the attention of, of congresswoman barbara lee 
and um, and then she wanted to help spread the word. That's beautiful. Good for her. Good for her. Now yeah. the other thing. So as we talk about the the farmers, do they have like farmer markets? I mean, is there some place where we can actually go see some of these black farmers? Where would we go? Uh, thank you. Um, so after so after the grocery store was after our planning grant, the grocery store, um, I, as I mentioned, just kind of like, I, the purpose of the grocery store was because we were thinking that we could have, our farmers could have a place where you could purchase their food every day. Okay. You know, most farmers market happen, you know, once a week, some even once a month. Right. And so we were uh, saying that, hey, if we have a store, they could constantly supply the store. And, um, and so, we, so I kind of switched into the familyhood of, of really working some of the, the first Saturdays because I didn't feel like it was sustainable. Okay. Doing. Um, another organization called the Freedom Farmers Market kind of piggybacked on what we were doing, started working with the African-American Farmers of California. Um, they're uh, headed by uh, Dr. Gail Myers and they host the Farmers Market on like 50, 45th and Shattuck in Oakland. Okay. So um, that still continues. The African-American okay. farmers still come down and uh, we actually held part of our film festival at their farmer's market this past year to bring more awareness so people know that the black farmers are still coming down to Oakland. Um, you know, the last couple of years have been very strenuous because of the pandemic. Yeah. And so I don't, and, you know, and now around this time, it's hard to do a market because you get the rain going on. Right. So I don't know. I think they're doing it once a month and then they're going to kick it off when it's once a week, once again. Okay. Okay. Well, that's nice to know. Good to yes. know. Yes. Now, what are some of the ways people can help you, the listening audience? What could they do? How can they be supportive of the program? Well, I think the first thing, is to be educated about what we're trying to do, you know, um, to really become an advocate in your own community, um, to make sure that, you're, that your uh, child has student government and that they're involved in student government. And if you're a parent, be part of your school PTA. If you're an alumni, be part of your alumni association. And, um, and if you see that, you know, a once a month effort can help bring you all together, you know, with familyhood. Then we're hope we're hoping that we can help promote people to come out to your school, and to you know, and you know, get your garden going, and we'll do whatever we can to help, you know, create the model of really empowering you know the community using the school as the uh, centerpiece. Okay. The, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Nice. So now, David, we're going to actually take a break from all of that and then okay. I'm gonna get some personal stuff from you again. Okay. So looking back over your life and career, name three people that have been inspirational to you. Uh, my mother, my father, my oldest brother. Okay. I say my oldest brother, all my brothers, all my brothers, but I have an older brother who's, who's a doctor and who's, probably you know he was at Morehouse and and I think from a child I wanted to go to Morehouse but I have another brother who who's writing plays and he would inspire me to go into film um okay. there's so many I can't even I can just okay. say that um you know Dr. King a lot of the ancestors who who we who I mentioned Booker T. Washington Marcus Garvey um Ida B. Wells and Sojourner Truth and you know so many that uh are in these books behind me that really, um, you know, inspired me to, um, you know, to work towards a vision and to really appreciate being on their shoulders. And my my wife Nicole, my children, who <laughs> really Solomon and Sayla, because they, you know, I miss so many Saturdays being at our farmers market. That okay, it was hard at times for for you know, because you're at school all week. You say, hey, where's dad? He's at the market. So they had to, you know, they had to sacrifice their dad sometimes to be in the community and doing different things. And, and so all that was been really um, 
inspiring because so many people have sacrificed for me to be here um, today. Okay, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, now, what would your nine-year-old David say to the grown man David today? Hmm. The nine-year-old would um, would say um, nine is a really it was a big year for me. I was just starting to play baseball then, and it was a time in my life where I had um, beginning to kind of research Black history. Okay. Um, I remember I had an assignment to write a biography of somebody important. And I went home and one of my brothers, Bomani happened to be home at the time. He changed his name to Bomani some years later. His name is Newt. And I said, you know, I got this assignment. Who should I do? And he said, oh man, wearing his Kente Daishiki, <laughs> you should do Nat Turner. And so, so I, I went back to my classroom that after doing this paper and you had to turn in the paper, but you also had to present it to the class. And Julie Nakahara, as you mentioned earlier, one of my friends, she was in the audience because really I was really one of the only few black folks in my class. And when I spoke about Nat Turner, when I did the research on Nat Turner, I made the statement that he was like our, um, he was like our Patrick Henry, the one who said the British are coming, the British are coming uh -huh. for the, for the, in, you know, for the liberation of America uh, uh, against the British. And, um, and I remember I looked over to my teacher and my teacher was turning red because I mentioned <laughs> how he fought and they killed slave masters and they were trying to free black people out of bondage. And I think the seed was planted in me then that our freedom wasn't as respected as other people's freedom. Mm -hmm. And and so the nine-year-old from I think would say to me today, we still got a lot of work to do and don't look back, keep keep moving forward because you know right now the situation is 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 I think even I think we're in a more dire we yes, are, we have because when I was nine, I feel like I remember getting my hair cut in certain neighborhoods in, in Folsom, you know, in San Francisco. I remember like black communities. I remember, you know, and I feel like the nine year old is like, man, you got to pick up the pace, brother. <laughs> you got <laughs> to pick up the pace, you know, it, it's not, you know. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah. That's, yeah. Well, you know, what? that's so amazing that you touched on that when you said that, you know, it's actually hasn't gotten better. In some ways it has, in so many ways it hasn't. The simple fact that they're trying to take our books out of the schools, it's like, you've got to be kidding me. Right. You know, you, you can take the books out, but that still doesn't change the history. It doesn't change it, you know? So anyways, that's a whole nother interview. So David- It's important, it's important to know that um, because it, it's, if you know our history, then you know that, you know, Africa was erased from the history books. And, and people would say, well, why are those noses broken off in Egypt? You know, and, mm -hmm. and why is it that there's so much, like you got these people talking about Martians and whatnot that came in to deny the fact that these were African people who built the pyramids and had all this great civilization. So they make it like UFOs came here, you know, all these years ago. <laughs> Just right? anything, wait, anything but us, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. And they talk about how these were, you know, white people who were browned by the sun, you know, for some people. Um, but then you have people um, who were real scholars who, um, I'm trying to think of the book I have. What's that book? Uh, but anyway, he um, he talked about, um, I'm trying to think of his name, but he went to Kemet, to Egypt in the 1700s. And he said, when he did the research and he wrote about it, that the same people that we call barbarians actually built civilization. Okay. The sciences and the mathematics 
And when he returned with this information, he was thrown in jail. And so, so, the, so the removing of the books today is just like a modern day attempt to keep us from really knowing ourselves and, and for others to know, you know what is true and, um, and to hopefully keep us down. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, and so, so I think that it's gonna backfire. I think that because they are trying to prevent you from reading these books, you know, just like, you, gonna, yeah. You know, worst thing you can do as a parent is say, <laughs> I don't want you being right. with that boy. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> your, your daughter's gonna be like, wait a minute, you know, like you can't do that. You know what I mean? Right, like, exactly. You go ahead and let them see each other, you know, maybe ask some questions like, well, are you guys studying together? Is he studying or is he planning on, you know, so uh -huh. you can let her hopefully know that, well, you know, you gotta study to be, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so, um, so I think it's gonna backfire. Oh yeah, because when you um, tell you know, people not to do something, they're exactly. gonna do it. That exactly. you know, they're gonna they're gonna want to know. And right. so I'm glad that they're doing that because right. what's happening, people are researching, you know, thanks to Google, right. it'll all pop up. There you it go. It will pop up. Like so. these are the books that, that they don't want you to read. It'd be like, well, I'm reading that book. <laughs> exactly. You know, somebody tell you don't press that, whatever you do, don't press that red button. Guess exactly. what? That person presses the red button. So oh, absolutely. So yeah, so no, we're definitely um. You know, but the simple fact that there are people like yourself out there doing good work and actually reminding people of our founding fathers and mothers that you cannot go forward until you know where you came from. Yes. And the simple fact that you're reaching back to Carver and um, Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Yeah, Booker Thomas T. Campbell exactly. That you're yeah. actually referencing them and like these mm -hmm. are the peoples who shoulders you're still standing on because you can't get better than them you know and so when I think about when I hear people say oh they got that slave mentality and I said you better wish because some slaves were so brilliant so bright <laughs> I'm right. like you do not have a slave mentality you have right. the white man's mentality the one your your slave master mentality that's what you have yes you know, because uh, slaves were always trying to figure out ways to for freedom, to find that freedom. And, you know, we're still in that boat right now where we're still trying to find our freedom. That's and, right. you know, when I think about Martin Luther King, I'm like, I wonder what he would say right now. He'd be like, you've got to be kidding me. I, I agree. I think, um, ooh, especially with this war in Ukraine going on, um, I mean, because he was he was a, he was a humanitarian he was he was hoping for all races to understand we have a, a potential and a responsibility to live and let live yeah you know and i think that um um our leadership you know um just their operation uh breadbasket that he was doing before he was uh assassinated uh i think would be on a whole different level now where he was able to host those press conferences mm -hmm. and, and go to a city like Oakland and say, uh, you know, to Clorox or other big companies and say, wait a minute, we got 40% black folks in Oakland and you only have 10% working for you. Yeah. You need to put some money in here so that we can start hiring black people to work. Otherwise we're going to, you know, and that was happening through, you know, through that program. And I think that was, um, as he talked about in his in his uh, last book, uh, where do we go from here? Chaos our community. Um, that you know this was part of their program, and so you know Jesse Jackson and, and then uh, uh, Abernathy kind of continued that work. Um, but I think that um, definitely his 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 curve towards justice is is really missing we miss him and yeah. it was just yesterday i mean yeah. if you really think about it i know like my, my mother she'll be 90 in um in may and she used to make daishikis that king would wear when he would come into town oh, okay you know? and so he was just you know they're around the same age he would still be just an elder if he was allowed to do the work um yeah 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 mm -hmm. Mouthful. So David, is there anything else you would like to say to our listening audience before we say goodbye? And then also let them know how they can reach you. 
Yes, um, I would I would just um, say that you know familyhood, the familyhood connection at our organization. Um, FirstSaturdays.com is the website to promote what we call the monthly volunteer day to advance towards familyhood at every school in every community. And I can be reached at um, droach at firstsaturdays.com. That's one S-T, Saturdays, plural, dot com. Wow. Well, David, thank you again for being my guest thank on you. Straight Talking with Kelly. Uh, all right. Thank you. And I'm definitely looking forward to our part two, where we're going to talk about the Oakland International Film Festival All right. that's coming up. So okay. you stay put, okay. audience. You stay tuned because I will be back. And again, thanks for listening to Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. Make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and share this information with your friends. All righty. Looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.